content, at least through chapter 19. Maybe Wednesday we'll do something on chapter 20. I don't know. We'll worry about it when we get there. But, for your information, if you've not yet recognized such, chapter 20 is introduction to thermodynamics title-wise. Chapter 21 is more thermodynamics title-wise. Yet everything we have done this term and most of what you did last term is guess what? Thermodynamics. There's only two ways by which the progress of reactions can be studied. Two general ways. Thermodynamically and kinetically. You can't do a whole lot with the kinetic analysis in first year chemistry. Can't do a whole lot with the kinetic analysis in undergraduate chemistry. The theories are very sophisticated. The mathematics is quite challenging. You know, I have to know how to deal with differential equations and such. And the gadgetry required to do most kinetic studies is very delicate, sophisticated, and expensive. We hardly have the wherewithal to equip undergraduate laboratories with the stuff necessary to do kinetic investigations the proper way. And since folks at that stage of the game are insufficiently educated to tackle this stuff, we don't do a whole lot with kinetics in undergraduate stuff. Yet, biochemic, biochemical considerations, body chemistry, more often than not, depend on kinetic progress rather than thermodynamic progress. So if you're going to be good at biochemistry, you got to know this stuff. But more on that later for any of you who may be so interested. I hope you are. Good stuff. My golly, we brought in 60 new graduate students this year. Half of that class is aimed at biochemistry. Not unusual at all. In fact, to be expected. But thermodynamics, aha! Well, we pay attention to energy, stability, structure of reactants before anything happens. And compare that to energy, stability, structure of products after everything happens. No time factor consideration at all. No pathway consideration at all. Which in that regard makes thermodynamics a lot more straightforward to study than kinetics. Again, if for no other reason. Time is not a factor from a thermodynamic standpoint. And so, what's equilibrium all about? How stable are the products compared to how stable are the reactants? That's what it's all about. That's all we've done so far. Now then, from a chapter 19 specific standpoint, tomorrow in discussion class, You'll proceed with the analysis of the calcium hydroxide saturated solution equilibrium system that you've investigated in laboratory in assignment three. And that's considered in the notes on page 1916, the analysis of which carries on through 1919. And one of the things you'll realize is that by chemical treatment of the calcium hydroxide equilibrium system, you will often convert that to a different equilibrium system. If you give calcium ion the opportunity to react with a material like carbonate ion or sulfate ion and form a material which is more stable in the presence of water than calcium hydroxide, wham! By treatment with a source of carbonate, by treatment with a source of sulfate, you'll build a new equilibrium into that system. So again, tomorrow, discussion class. Big part of exam two, be there. So we're going to jump to page 1920 and talk about the remaining consideration brought to you in chapter 19 about ways by which the solubility of salt of limited solubility in water can be affected by giving the metal ion component of the salt the opportunity to react with something in the system to make a complex ion. 
so this will introduce to us the one remaining type of equilibrium constant which we have yet to consider we've been with k w k a k b k s p and now comes kf equilibrium constant for which the sub f stands for formation so the value for the equilibrium constant is a measure of the thermodynamic effectiveness of the component species of the complex ion to react with each other and make the complex ion. In some data tables, thermodynamic data tables, you'll see this considered from a K sub D standpoint. Remember what the sub D stands for? You looked at sub D transformations, delta H sub D, last term in 2045, at least I expect you did. Remember what the sub D stands for? dissociation the complex ion falling apart same equilibrium just going the other direction like KSP is the salt on the left and equilibrium with its component ions turn that around you still got a legitimate equilibrium expression but now it's one over KSP to get at this we need to learn some new language that of Lewis acid Lewis base chemistry and the nature and formation of the coordinate covalent bond. In chemistry 2045, I expect that the only type of covalent bond formation process that you considered is a consequence of interaction between a species, like a hydrogen atom, which has got at least one unpaired electron in its valence structure, meets up with another atom, like H atom meets another H atom, which also has at least one unpaired electron in its valence electron structure. And on collision, what happens? These unpaired electrons pair up and make a shared electron pair bond, the covalent bond. Well, what's the difference in forming a coordinate covalent bond? The difference is one of the species that engages in reaction to make the coordinate covalent bond supplies an empty orbital. It's a Lewis acid and it accepts the electron pair into its empty orbital as part of the bond formation process. So the simplest way to define a Lewis acid is called an electron pair acceptor. And the other partner in the bond formation process the other reacting species supplies an electron pair, most often a non-bonding pair. Sometimes a pi electron pair can also be supplied, but we won't deal with that part. We'll just consider the most simple, common example of a Lewis base, an electron pair donor. <coughs> Lewis acid. By something you learned about in 2045, how can you recognize the ability of a species to be a Lewis acid? Remember, to be a Lewis acid, you've got to have one or more empty valence orbitals. So what property of the species in question do you have to consider to find out if it's got one or more empty valence orbitals? Yes! Electron configuration. You did that. In 2045? What property of a species will you consider to find out if it's likely to be capable of behaving as a Lewis base? What will you do to find out if it's got one or more valence non-bonding electron pairs? Right, it's Lewis yeah! Right, it's Lewis structure, you betcha. So if you have not yet gotten on top of the Lewis structure construction business, you better get there right now, right? I mean now, I mean I mean yesterday. Simplest example, or an extremely simple example of forming a coordinate covalent bond. Lewis acid H plus. What empty orbital does H plus have? What is it? 1s. Remember hydrogen and helium, the only two atoms? which are part and parcel of energy level number one, period number one, that's it. It's period number one. 
energy level number one, has a maximum electron capacity of two. That's it. So hydrogen with one total electron, helium with two total electrons, those are the only two atoms which together comprise all the elements of period number one. That's it. Because once you get to lithium, you've got a three electron species. And you've gone beyond the electron capacity for energy level number one. So here, the picture I've shown on the board is rather an example of a mechanism. You're going to do this kind of stuff all the time in organic class. Organic chemists are often referred to as electron pair pushers. Because what we imagine, in this case, to form the hydronium ion by interaction of H plus with a water molecule is one of the non-bonding pairs from the oxygen atom of the water molecule moves toward the empty 1s valence orbital of H plus and takes occupation within. That forms the coordinate covalent bond. So we're imagining the electron pair moves. It's really the water molecule clunks H plus and when they clunk each other then the electron pair at the same time takes occupation in the empty 1s orbital. And thereby the coordinate covalent bond between H plus and water to make the hydronium ion has been formed. All right. Here's another illustration of a Lewis acid, Lewis base reaction. Aluminum ion gets together with six water molecules to make hydrated aluminum ion with six water molecules of hydration. We've already recognized this species because of its presence in our acid base table and talked about its chemistry. Here's a simple ball and stick model of something like hydrated aluminum ion. What's this geometry? What is this geometry? What is this geometry? Octahedral. Let's put in this far more accurate representation of a water molecule. Here's our aluminum ion, empty valence orbital, simulated by this hole in the model. Meek! The electron pair bond forms. And this becomes a bonding pair. So I'd have to take out the stick from this, turn it into a bond stick. And there we have it. Now, of course, you've learned, I trust, that covalent bonds are not accurately at all represented by these sticks. We use these sticks to show you the positions of the bond. But in fact, the valence electron cloud, in this case of the oxygen atom of the water molecule and the aluminum ion, overlap with each other when this coordinate covalent bond is formed. So you'll have six water molecules, each of which rather resembles this, smushed into this, and of course for the water molecule itself, the hydrogen atoms and their electron clouds are smushed into the electron cloud of the oxygen atom. But if we're going to give you the opportunity to learn where the positions of these bonds are, to get a better idea of what structure is, we use the sticks to simulate the positions of the bonding electron pairs and the loops to simulate the positions of the non-bonding pairs while bearing in mind that electrons themselves, practically speaking, occupy zero spatial volume. They dictate spatial volume, but they themselves occupy essentially zero spatial volume because they're so damn tiny. Aluminum ion. The Lewis acid in this reaction. Question. Theoretically, how many coordinate covalent bonds can Al plus 3 form? So we're going to pick back at your knowledge 
of electron configurations, which presumably you got from 2045. Theoretically, how many total coordinate covalent bonds can aluminum ion form? What I'm asking you is how many empty valence orbitals does Al3 plus have? All right, we'll go through a count. You raise your hand when I hit the number which you think is correct. One. And when you put your hand up, you keep it up. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Nine is right. How many put their hands up when I said nine? What are these nine empty valence orbitals? Well, let's go back and take a look at the aluminum atom itself, an atomic member of period number three. How many total electrons can occupy energy level number three, which corresponds to the valence level for period three atoms? You remember the recipe from 2045? The number of electrons which can be placed in an energy level or let's fall, call it the electron capacity of an energy level. Do you remember the recipe which gives you this? It's a very, very difficult, complicated recipe. 2n squared. What's n? What is n? The quantum level. We're talking about energy level number three. So get out your calculators. Because 3 times 3 has to be computed. That's n squared. Nine. Times 2. 18. And how many electrons max can occupy an orbital? How many? Two. two. So if I got 18 electron capacity and I can put two electrons in an orbital, how many orbitals have I got in energy level number three? How about that? And for Al plus three, they're there and they're all empty, every one of them. Because the maximum number of valence electrons the aluminum atom has is three, right? A 3s2 pair and a single 3p electron. And when I turned that into Al plus three, I took away all those electrons. So every valence orbital for Al plus three is there and empty. What are these empty valence orbitals? 3s, the 3p sublevel. How many orbitals in a p sublevel? How many orbitals in a p sublevel? Three. Three. Px, py, pz is the way they are usually labeled because xyz refers to Cartesian coordinate reference axes which are three straight lines which intersect in space at a place called the origin and geometrically relate to each other how? Cartesian coordinate axes, how do they relate to each other geometrically? They are mutually perpendicular. Bingo! That's why PX, PY, PZ. Because XYZ Cartesian coordinates likely you have heard before. Aha! But when we get to energy level number three after p orbitals, we see another kind of orbital in there. What's it called? D. How many orbitals in D sublevel? Five. five. Well, one plus three plus five gives me nine. There it is. So on occasion, students ask, and it's a good question, why does an aluminum ion react with nine water molecules and make a hydrate which has got nine water molecules attached to a single aluminum ion? And the answer to this question is related to things that university students often try to do, particularly at keg parties. They like to see how many university students can get in a phone booth or Volkswagen Beagle, Beetle. And to my knowledge, the answer is less than hundreds. They just kind of smash them in there. Ha, ah, we got more. Another beer. Ha, ah, another more. I know how to game plays. Hell, I used to play it. Watch out, I still may. <laughs> These things are fun, provided you follow the philosophy advocated by the Greeks. Don't overdo it. Too much of anything is usually bad. 
point? If I have a basketball, how many BBs can I place in contact with a single basketball? Would you accept the answer, one hell of a lot? Goody. Aha! But when we talk about this interaction, aluminum ion is a bigger small ion. Small. Remember, it's got a high positive charge density. That's why it forms a defined hydrate. Water molecule is big next to aluminum ion. So let's turn the tables around. How many basketballs can you glue to a single BB? Two. Because if you go to try to go past two, now you've got what's called steric hindrance. Because of the size of the basketballs, they block each other from making contact with the BB. In this case, the aluminum ion is sufficiently large to make contact simultaneously with six water molecules, but not more. That's what it amounts to. One more question. Since I saw this written wrong in a textbook the other day, I'm not surprised. Guess what kind of textbook it was? General chemistry. <laughs> they do a lot of things in these books, but rarely chemistry. <laughs> Amazing. Lithium. Forms a defined hydrate, mildly acidic, to be expected because of the metal ions derivable from family 1A metals, lithium plus is the smallest. So it has the highest positive charge density of metal ions obtainable from the 1A metals. What's the maximum number of water molecules? That can be hydrated to a single lithium ion. The maximum number. Four. That's correct. Why? Because it's got one S sub one three, or three. What are the valence orbitals with which lithium has? It's an energy level number two, isn't it? So it has eight available on constant basis, so four available. What are the valence orbitals? For any period two atom. It doesn't have to be just lithium. What are the valence orbitals for any period two atom? Two S and two P. No d orbitals yet. So that's four orbitals. The textbook I looked at had sub six there. Flunk. <laughs> Flunk. Now then, more on the nature of forming the coordinate covalent bond, or shall we say the energy associated with a Lewis acid, Lewis base reaction. H plus is our Lewis acid. Three potential Lewis bases. Chloride ion, which has got four valence non-bonding pairs. The water molecule, which has got two. And the ammonia molecule, which has got how many valence non-bonding pairs? One. With which of these Lewis bases does this Lewis acid interact most strongly? Come on, chapter 18. With which of these Lewis bases does this Lewis acid interact most strongly? Chloride ion to make HCl? Water molecule to make hydronium ion? Or ammonia to make ammonium ion? Would you like to look at the acid base table and again recognize that for the three acids which we have just considered, HCl is by far the strongest, isn't it? It's the one which most readily loses H plus, isn't it? Whereas ammonium ion of these three acids is by far the weakest because of these three Lewis bases, ammonia is the strongest Bronsted base. So we're reminding ourselves with this consideration that a bronsted lowry acid base reaction is also a Lewis acid Lewis base reaction. It's just that when we talk about bronsted lowry acid base reactions, the Lewis acid is strictly and exclusively H plus. 
But when we open up this new bag of tricks, Lewis acid, Lewis base chemistry, to recognize the possibility of a whole bunch of Lewis acids beside H+, we can realize that although all bronze de Laurier acid base reactions are discussable in terms of Lewis acid, Lewis base, the converse is not true. Because once you change the Lewis acid to something other than H+, now it's no longer bronze de Laurier acid base. Like aluminum ion interacting with water molecules. That's strictly a Lewis acid, Lewis base reaction. All right, now let's change the Lewis acid. Let's make it silver ion. Well, let's keep silver ion on the table for a moment and start to talk about some silver ion chemistry which relates directly to this discussion. Here's a reaction. Silver ion and aqueous media interacts with ammonia molecules to form this, the silver ammonia complex ion. A product of a Lewis acid, Lewis base reaction between this Lewis acid and these Lewis bases. K for this reaction, by definition, is the formation equilibrium constant, K sub F, for the silver ammonia complex ion and has a value of 1.7 times 10 to the seventh. So I wrote here so. So means, is this thing stable? Yes. You're damn right. Look at that K value. Okay. Now then, a cylinder, never mind the A, I forgot to clean it off. 200 molar silver nitrate solution, just like you folks use it in the laboratory. Let's put a good shot of that in there. I'm going to build up the system volume just a little bit with some additional deionized water just to make visualization easier for you folks. That's good. And to the silver ion, which is now swimming around in this solution, in addition to nitrate ions and water molecules as principal species. Oh, I'm going to add this stuff. I don't know if any of you, you folks close enough, can you see this? This is 1.0 molar sodium chloride solution. What's going to happen when I put this sodium chloride solution in there? What will I see? What will I see? What color? Will it be a real nice shiny white? Or will it be a curdy white? The silver chloride is often described as a curdy precipitate. Curdy. You familiar with that word? It refers to spoiled milk. It's curded. Little clumps rather than distinct crystals. Uh-oh. Look at all those little clumps. I mean damn little. Just to ensure reaction completeness, a couple of shakes. And since the silver ion is two hundredths molar, the chloride ion is one molar, it's a pretty fair bet that we have captured just about every silver ion in the pot and turned it into <clears throat> semi-soluble silver chloride. Okay? Now pause for a moment and take a look at this reaction. This reaction considers the chemistry which can occur when silver chloride meets with ammonia. We have just produced the silver chloride. What we're going after is question 1928. Question 1928 says to you, poured silver ion, which is the stronger Lewis base? Is it chloride ion or ammonia? Now we already know it's not water because silver ion in the presence of water readily reacts with ammonia to make that. So, in competition for silver ion as a Lewis acid, for the three possible Lewis bases, we know water is not in the game. Six molar ammonia. Something happening to the silver chloride? Oh, 
Where's my silver chloride? It reacted with ammonia to become this stuff. While the chloride ions were given to the solution. And now we get to the $64 question. Which of these Lewis bases, chloride ion or ammonia, reacts more strongly with silver ion? How many vote for ammonia? Hey, you know, I want to count up all the wrong votes. Don't ever forget the gang up factor. Do you remember that this sodium chloride solution is one molar? And the ammonia solution is six molar. So, at a glance we can see, I've certainly put enough ammonia in the pot to dissolve all the silver chloride and turn it into the silver ammonia complex ion. All right? Now let's go back to what we have on the board where we're going to look at K for this equilibrium. We're going to put in numbers. One point seven squared is two point nine. What's ten to the seventh times ten to the minus ten? What is it? Ten to the minus three. Is this number a good deal bigger or a good deal smaller than one? Good deal smaller than one. 0 0.0029 if I write it as a decimal fraction. Would you like to reconsider your vote for who makes the stronger bonds with silver chloride? I mean with silver ion? Chloride ion or ammonia? Because the value of this equilibrium constant tells you does this equilibrium lie to the right or lie to the left? To the left. Now then, Let's do a problem. Specifically, nineteen twenty-eight, which is what we're on. We want the molar solubility of silver chloride in six point zero molar ammonia. So here's what we're gonna do is consider one point zero mole silver chloride treated with 1.0 liters of 6.0 molar ammonia. And see how the system inventories after the chemistry takes place for the mix we're considering. This is the reaction that's going to occur. Okay. For this calculation. How would you like to refer to the concentration of the silver ammonia complex ion at equilibrium? Remember, we want to calculate solubility of silver chloride in 6 molar ammonia, and we know when silver chloride dissolves in 6 molar ammonia, we make the silver ammonia complex ion. So I'll call it S. Isn't that the way we've represented solubility so far? Well, if S represents the equilibrium molarity of the silver ammonia complex ion, how will S compare to the chloride ion molarity for this system? Hmm? How will chloride ion compare to S for this system if the silver ammonia complex ion molarity is S? Yes. S! Does the stoichiometry of this thing tell you 
For every mole of this you make, you make a mole of this, and there's no extra source here of chloride ion or the silver ammonia complex ion. So these molarities established by this mix, these molarities will be the same. What will be the equilibrium molarity of the ammonia? What will be the equilibrium molarity of ammonia? I'm listening. What was the original molarity of the ammonia? 6.0. How much of the ammonia had to get used up to establish this equilibrium? 2S, right? Don't forget the stoichiometry. This started out as 6.0. The coefficient tells us that to make S moles per liter of silver ammonia complex ion or S moles per liter of chloride ion, you've got to use, use up two S moles per liter of ammonia. So there it is. Tough problem, huh? We'll take the square root. Since each side's a perfect square, and we'll get S equals 0 0.29 molar. That means the equilibrium molarity of chloride ion and the silver ammonia complex ion will each be 0 0.29 molar in this system. Well, if that's true, how much AgCl remains? How much AgCl didn't dissolve? We started with a mole, 0.29 dissolved. So 0.71 moles remains. So look at the system we made. Moles of ammonia in this system outnumbers moles of chloride ion by what ratio? Six to one. Now I understand that to make the silver ammonia complex ion, per mole of silver ion complex, I need two moles of ammonia. Whereas per mole of silver ion precipitated, I only need a mole of chloride ion. But I got a system where the mole ratio of ammonia to chloride ion is six to one. Heavily in favor of ammonia. And after I did this experiment, a lot of you were saying, oh, ammonia makes the stronger bonds, like Hella does. Watch out. Be careful when you jump to these conclusions. You have to do the analysis to find out. Because all we did here was to gang up on the chloride ion so effectively that we got all the silver ion to be taken away from contact with chloride ion and complexed by ammonia. The gang up factor is what got this accomplished. So this proves, hey, with ammonia at a ratio of six to one over chloride ion, the chloride ion still beats the hell out of the ammonia. It's got more than twice the amount of silver ion captured compared to ammonia. There's the analysis. Now then, back to our cylinder. Let's have a little bit more fun. Let's have a little bit more fun regarding DSI. You cannot escape from this. That's the only way you can get at chemistry. What the heck's in the system you're considering? I'm going to take this system. You saw how we prepared it, made some silver chloride, dissolved the silver chloride with ammonia treatment, and now I'm going to treat this with 6 molar nitric acid solution. When I treat this system with 6 molar nitric acid solution, tell me what you expect to see. You think the silver chloride will come back? Because the hydronium ion will beat the living hell out of ammonia, won't it? And I'll make the silver chloride come back, okay? So, we made a successful prediction. When I put the nitric acid in here, the nitric acid solution, really I'm putting in the hydronium ion and nitrate ion, the silver ammonia complex ion is going to be wrecked as I wreck ammonia. 
The silver chloride will come back. But I want you to pay attention, not just to the reformation of silver chloride, which will occur down here. I want you to see what happens above the solution, above the solution. You see there's distinct smoke? <laughs> we know what the white stuff is in the system down here, the solid. That's silver chloride. What's the smoke? What is the smoke? You realize we talked about an experiment that just just that is just like this a couple days ago? When we imagined we were in the laboratory and told you about taking some ammonium chloride and putting it in a crucible, which you've all done in 46 laboratory, in assignment two, and heated it strongly. And above the crucible, you saw smoke, didn't you? And I asked you all what the hell the smoke is, and nobody knew! Some said ammonia. Some said HCl. Some even said water vapor. But I don't recall anybody saying that it was ammonium chloride because a smoke in the main is a finely divided particulate suspension of solids in vapor. It's not transparent to light smoke. So in that smoke there's a solid. What is this solid? Because what you did in lab was to cause transfer of H plus from ammonium ion to chloride ion. So HCl and ammonia left the system. They're each gases. But when they got above the system and started to cool off and recontact with each other, they reacted and reformed ammonium chloride. That was the smoke. What is this smoke? I'm listening. I want to hear the name. Tain ammonium chloride. But I'll give you this clue. Ammonium ion is the cation in this smoke. Ammonium? Nitrate. Ammonium nitrate! You're damn right. Didn't we pass through a system which we treated with ammonia? So it's going to have ammonia vapors in there, six molar ammonia. Would you like to take the six molar ammonia, take the cap off it, take a deep breath? No, you don't want to do that. So when the hydronium ion and nitrate ion pass through this ammonia vapor, Reaction with hydronium ion and ammonia occurred, and that made ammonium ion, didn't they? And as soon as the ammonium ion looked at these nitrate ions in the vapor, they said, ah, I gotcha! And made the smoke. Pick it up from this point next time.